Hello. Welcome back to Lily's Viking Adventure for some more rambling from yours truly. Thank you for joining me again. Today, I found an article from worldhistory.org by Joshua J. Markby. It was published on the 9th of January, 2019. So in 2017 CE, Uppsala University archaeologist Charlotte Hindestirna Johnson published her study of a Viking grave discovered in Berka, Sweden in the 1800 CE, which she and her team had revisited. She claimed that what was formerly understood as a Viking warrior's grave was that of a woman, confirmed by DNA tests, and that this proved that female Viking warriors existed during the Viking Age, 790 to 1100 CE. However, Hindenstierna Johnson's claims quickly unraveled when challenged by Professor Judith Jesch, an expert not just on the Vikings, but also on women in the Viking Age, who pointed out multiple problems with the procedures involved and the conclusions the team came to. Jesch's opinion which is also that of the majority of scholars, is that there were no female Viking warriors, as this would have been antithetical to the Viking ethos. Even though women shared equal rights with men, they could own land, initiate divorce, serve as clergy, and run their own business, their sphere of influence was largely domestic. Women took care of the home, the elderly relatives, and the children, and were unlikely to be tolerated slipping those responsibilities to join men in battle. Norse literature and mythology, however, depicts a number of legendary women who do precisely that. These women are described either in the Icelandic sagas of the 12th and 13th centuries CE, in the work of Snorri Sturluson, 1179 to 1241 CE, an Icelandic mythographer who wrote down and preserved earlier Norse works which had been transmitted orally, or in the historical and semi-historical works of other writers, such as the Dane Saxo Grammaticus, 1160 to 1220 CE. All of these accounts, of course, post-date the Viking Age, and the sagas especially are considered unreliable as they often relate magical or mystical events, which cannot be corroborated. Even so, they reflect a Norse admiration for the strong woman who takes it upon herself to get what she wants and go where she pleases. Shield Maidens, Vikaries, and Heroines the most famous type of immortal warrior woman known from the sagas is the shield maiden, who is mirrored in the spiritual realm of the afterlife by the Valkyries. The shield maiden was allegedly a woman who took up arms and armor and fought in battle alongside men. The best known account of this comes from Saxo Grammaticus in his description of the Battle of Bravala or Bravalir. 750 CE, though its historicity has been challenged. In his early 13th century CE Gasta Denorum, where he claims 300 shield maidens fought for the Danes, <clears throat> the Valkyries, of course, were the supernatural warrior women warriors who chose the dead in battle and led them to Odin's Hall of Valhalla. The concept of a strong woman warrior is epitomized in the Swedish legend Blenda Sagenen, which tells of the heroine Blenda of Småland, 500 or 750 CE, who saves her country from invasion by the Danes by inviting the Danish warriors to a feast, getting them drunk, and together with her army of women, killing them all while they sleep. This story first appears in print in the 17th century CE, though it is thought to be much older. There is no way to verify its historicity, but as far as the image of the female warrior is concerned, there is no need to. Whether Blinda actually defeated the Danes is not as important as the fact the legend exists, 
and was popular enough to be repeated. Clearly, if the legend is indeed that old, Norse culture respected women enough to elevate them to the same level as the great heroes. This same paradigm can be seen in the Icelandic sagas and the myths of the Norse and is epitomized in the 10 Norse female figures. Skadi, goddess of hunting and skiing. Freya, goddess of fertility, love, and luck. Brynhild, the Valkyrie who becomes mortal, avenges herself. Lagertha, the victorious shield maiden. Hervor, wielder of the magic sword of Tyrfim. Freydis Eriksdotter, explorer and defender of her party. Gudrid Thorbjörn Dotter, explorer in North America, Vinland. Sigurd the Proud, who ruled her own, on her own, killed her suitors. Un the Deep-Minded, settled Iceland, commanded her own fleet. And Olga of Kiev, regent of the Kievan Rus, avenged her husband's death. So let's start with Skadi. Skadi is the daughter of the giant Thiazi, who was killed by the god Thor of Asgard. Since her father had no males to avenge him, Skadi took helmet and all the weapons of war and went to Asgard to avenge her father. Thus appearing at the gates fully armed, she is placated by an offer by the Asgardians to choose her own husband from among them, but must do so only by looking at their feet. She chooses one she thinks will be the handsome Balder, but it turns out to be Njord, god of the sea. Skadi enjoys the mountains where she hunts and skis while Njord likes the dark, his dark, damp cave by the water. They try to compromise of living in each other's residence for nine days at a time, but Skadi cannot endure it and leaves him for her mountain home. She's possibly the mother of two of the most important Norse gods, Freyr and Freya. But no mention is made of her having a part in their upbringing. After she separates from Njord, she pursues her own entrance, interests, including having a number of affairs with Odin. Freya. Freya is among the most popular of the Norse pantheon and was the goddess of luck and fertility, love, lust, and the afterlife and protection. She rides through the heavens in her carriage pulled by cats and gives freely of all she has to humanity. As a fertility goddess, she was invoked by the Vikings for good harvests, but also for strong children and stable marriages, which were thought to benefit from her blessings. Her association with warfare and battles has to do with her realm in the afterlife. Freya presides over Folkvinger, field of the people, and is said to collect half of the fallen on the battlefield for herself, and the other half are gathered by Odin for Valhalla. Folkvinger is seldom mentioned in Norse lit literature, but from the little there is, it seems Freya may also watch as warriors engage in perpetual combat or at least there is part of folk, Folkvanger reserved for these contests. Brynhild. Brynhild, or Brunhilda, is a Valkyrie who, after supporting the wrong hero in a contest overseen by Odin, is made mortal and is imprisoned in a castle behind the walls, the Wall of Shields, asleep within a ring of fire until rescued by a champion. The hero, Sigurd, rescues her and gives her a ring promising to marry her, but must first go to the court of the king, Njuki. Njuki's wife, a sorceress, wants Sigurd to marry her daughter, Gudrund, and gives Sigurd a potion which makes him forget Brynhild. The sorceress also orchestrates Brynhild's rescue by her son Gunnar, who will then marry her, but Gunnar cannot cross the Ring of Fire. Sigurd shapeshifts into Gunnar's form, rescues Brynhild, and she marries Gunnar, believing he was the one who rescued her. In an argument with Gudrun, 
Brunhild learns that it was Sigurd who rescued her, but then forsook her and swears revenge on them all. She kills Sigurd's young son and then has Sigurd killed in his sleep. As his funeral pyre is lighted, she leaps into it and dies with him. As she rides with him to the afterlife in hell, she encounters a giantess who chides her for her behavior. But Brunhild is unrepentant, saying how she and Sigurd will now live their lives together as they were intended. According to the sagas, they somehow had a daughter in the midst of all this drama, Oslog, one of the wives of Ragnar Lothbrok. Lagertha. Lagertha, also known as Lagertha, is only known from chapter, what is that, five, six of Saxo Grammaticus, Gesta Denorum, History of the Danes. The legendary hero Ragnar Lothbrok comes to Norway to avenge the death of his grandfather, Siward, and the humiliation of his wives and kinfolk at the hands of Fro, the king of Sweden. He is greeted by a number of women dressed as men who volunteer to help him, as Saxo writes. Among them was Lagerda, a skilled female warrior who, though a maiden, had the courage of a man and fought in front among the bravest, with her hair loose over her shoulders. All marveled at her matchless deeds, for her locks flying down her back betrayed that she was a woman. Ragnar is so impressed by her, even attributes the victory of her, attributes the victory to her, her specifically, that he decides to make her his, his wife. But Lagertha posts a bear and a dog outside her house to guard against him. Ragnar kills both animals, marries her, and they have two daughters. But later, when he remembers how she tried to set the bear and dog to attack him, he divorces and marries another woman, Thora. Nothing more is known of Lagertha. Hervor. Hervor is the heroine of the 13th century CE Hervorer saga, Oak Heinrichs, and is also the name of her granddaughter, the daughter of her son Heinrich. Hervor's father, Agantir, had a magic sword called Tirfing, but was killed in a duel, and the sword was buried with him. Herver travels with her crew to the island of Samso in the Kattegat region, where Agantir is buried and summons his spirit, demanding the sword. Her father's ghost pleads with her to abandon her quest, but she will not be denied. Finally, he opens his grave and gives her the magic sword. The sword brings its owner nothing but trouble, and Herver has a number of adventures before settling down and getting married. Her son, Heidrich, inherits the sword, which causes him as many problems as it did her, his mother. After his death, the sword passes to his daughter, Herver, who ends up dying in battle. The most impressive part of the saga in Herver's defiance of convention and refusal to back down at her father's grave until she is given what she came for. Freydis, Eric's daughter. Freydis Eric's daughter, 970 to 1004 CE, was either a great woman warrior or an evil conniving murderess, depending on which of the two stories about her one reads. She appears in Eric the Red Saga, where she is the heroine, and the Saga of the Greenlanders, a villainess. In Eric the Red Saga, Freydis, daughter of Eric the Red, accompanies a party to Vinland, Newfoundland, North America. They are attacked by a group of natives, and the men of the party retreat, leaving Freydis alone. She calls out to them, Why you run away from such worthless creatures? Stout men are ye. When, as to me, when, as seems to me likely, you might slaughter them like so many cattle. Let me have a weapon. I think I could fight better than any of you. Even though she is unwell, possibly pregnant, and alone. Freydis grabs a sword from a dead comrade and tearing open her shirt and beating her breasts with the blade, defies the enemy who retreat from her, thus saving her party. 
In the saga of the Greenlanders, she accompanies her husband, his men, and two brothers, business partners, to Venland. She dislikes the brothers and also feels they are too presumptuous, so she frames them, telling her husband they abused and beat her and that she will divorce him if he does not avenge the insult. Her husband and his men kill the brothers, their party and their party, but will not hurt the women, so Freydis kills all the women herself with an axe. It is likely that this second story, written later than the first, is an attempt to discredit the strong female figure from the earlier saga. Unlike the more clearly mythological and legendary characters discussed above, Freydis has a higher chance of reflecting an actual historical person. As the consensus is that these two sagas that mentioned Venland remember real people and events that were at least partly preserved through an oral tradition. Goodrid, good, Goodrid, Thjörbarn Dotter, was among the earliest explorers of North America. According to both the Saga of the Greenlanders and Eric the Red's Saga, she was originally from Iceland, but went with her father and Eric the Red to settle Greenland. In Greenland, her husband died, and she soon after married the younger brother of Leif Eriksson, Thorstein and accompanied her husband and brother-in-law on their expedition to North America, where she explored Vinland and the others with the others in the party. Thorstein died there, and Gudrid returned to Greenland, where she married one Thorfinn Karlsfni some time later, and returned with him to Vinland to establish a permanent settlement there. Their son Snorri Thorfinnsson, was the first European child born in North America. Like Freydis, the Gudrid of the saga is likely rooted in an actual historical figure. Sigrid the Proud. Sigrid the Proud, 927 to 1014 CE, also known as Sigrid the Haughty, Sigrid Sturda, Storada, or Sigrid Tusta Totar was a Swedish queen who refused to live by other people's rules. She was married to Eric the Vit Victorious, King of Sweden, and after his death preferred to reign alone. She was courted by Harald Grinsky of Norway and Visavald of the Kievan Rus, but recognized that both were only interested in her for her land and wealth. She invited them to a party where after they and their men fell asleep from too much drink, she barred the doors of the hall and burned them to death to discourage future suitors. Her historicity, historicity is disputed, and thus this juicy story may be no more than a legend. The infam infamous Olaf Tryggvason, who converted the populace of Norway to Christian Christianity through torture, allegedly also sought her hand but insisted she convert to Christianity first. When she refused, he slapped her in public and Sigrid vowed revenge. She is said to have then married Svein Forkbeard for his connections and power and orchestrated the Battle of Svolder, in which Olaf was killed. Un the Deep-Minded. Ninth century CE, also known as Odd the Deep-Minded, and Un, or Odd Kettlestotter, was the, the daughter of Kettle Flatnose of Norway, who fled to Scotland following the rise of Harold Fairhair in Norway. When her father and her son Thorstein died, she understood her position in Scotland was precarious and went first to the Orkneys in the north and then to Iceland, which she explored before settling down. She commanded a crew of men who were so loyal to her that none would enter into marriage contracts which might jeopardize Un's property or power. She presided over her family and lands in, the, in southern Iceland literally up until her dying day. On the day of the marriage of her grandson, Olaf Filion, she oversaw the preparations and service and then retired nobly to her bedchambers where she died in her sleep. Olga of Kiev, my personal favorite. 
Olga of Kiev is better known as Saint Olga of the Kievan Rus. Although she is definitely understood as an actual historical figure, the account of her early reign as regent for her son Sviatoslav in the Russia Primary Chronicle contains a number of mythic legendary elements which place her among the legendary female Vikings, Varangian warriors. <clears throat> Olga was the wife of Igor of Kiev, who was the son of Rurik, and the adopted son of Oleg the prophet. Igor's excessive greed resulted in his assassination by the Drevlian tribe, a tribe of early East Slavs. Afterwards, the Drevlians wanted Olga to marry their prince Mal to consolidate the reign, the region, but Olga was only interested in avenging her husband's death. She first requested emissaries from the Drevlians, whom she tricked into being carried in honor in a boat toward her residence, and then had them dumped into a pit and buried alive. She then asked for the wisest among the Drevlians to come to her palace, and after inviting them to bathe before dinner, set fire to the bathhouses and burned them alive. She then requested the Drevlians prepare a great funeral feast to honor Igor, allowed everyone there to become drunk, and had her soldiers murder them all. Her final act of revenge was to drive the Drevlians into the city of Icarostin, where Igor had been killed, and then lay siege. When she found she could not take the city, she offered the lightest terms. She demanded three pigeons and three sparrows from each home. When these were delivered, she had her soldiers fasten sulfur to their claws and release them. And when they returned to their nests in the city, they set everything on fire. The entire city burned, and those who survived were killed or sold into slavery. But Olga spared a certain number so they could continue to pay her tribute. In conclusion, all of these women whether they were active warriors or strong female rulers, embodied the Viking ideal of independence and personal strength, even though they were largely idealized women. There is no evidence of actual shield maidens. Judith Jesch has noted that the interpretation of the Bir Birka Sweden warrior's grave as that of a woman warrior by Charlotte Hedinistira Johnson is symptomatic of a general 21st century CE fascination with female Viking warriors. I have always thought, she comments, and to some extent still do, that the fascination with women warriors, both in popular culture and in academic discourse, is heavily, probably too heavily, influenced by the 20th and 21st century desires. While that may be, there obviously there was obviously an equally strong fascination in the past, as evidenced by the work of Saxo Grammaticus and the Norse sagas. It seems clear that the Norse culture valued women enough to not only include female deities in their pantheon, but also attribute to them the same martial skills and ability to determine their own fate as men were allowed. There are, of course, strong female deities in the literature and mythology of many ancient civilizations. The Greeks had their Amazons and powerful goddesses like Athena, and the Romans, her counter counterpart Minerva, and other deities like Fortuna, who decided a person's good or bad luck in life. Even so, actual women in Greece and Rome did not have the same level of autonomy that Norse women enjoyed. Among the most ancient civilizations which worshipped female deities, only Egypt recognized women's rights on par with those of men. In Norse culture, however, even after the coming of Christianity, which notoriously and repeatedly denied women equality, women were not only appreciated but conceptually elevated to the, a status they themselves might not attain. The women who brewed the ale would not ever be a Freya or a Lagertha, but knowing that women could be so highly honored would probably have been a great comfort. Thank you for joining me again. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please like, share, subscribe, all those things help me grow my channel. I greatly appreciate it.